So I'm here in the woods sitting on a stump in a recent timber harvest, a selection cut harvested by a chainsaw and cable skitter. And honestly, this is exactly the type of harvest a lot of people think of when they think of good sustainable forestry. It was a relatively light removal, uh, there's a large amount of residual timber, and so forth. Certainly from the road, the harvest looks excellent. You can see some stumps and some trails, but generally speaking, it looks like nothing ever happened. And I'm sure the vast majority of people driving by never even knew the harvest took place. But if you walk in here with a trained eye, it's pretty bad. Terrible, even. Not only is there a lot of damage to the residual stand, but in terms of their silviculture, they weren't really accomplishing anything. In fact, all they really did was do a lot of damage to the forest in the long term. But I don't fully blame them because I understand the decision they were making. The only other alternative here would have been a clear cut and they were trying to avoid that. Even so, they made the wrong decision. So what I wanted to talk about in this video is why you shouldn't fear the nuclear option and what that even means. So first, let's talk about what they did and what they were trying to accomplish. So this stand is primarily softwood and intolerant hardwoods. So namely, we have actually a pretty good diversity of softwoods. We have some uh, red and black spruce, we have balsam fir, and even quite a bit of northern white cedar. And then for hardwoods, we have two primary species. We have big tooth aspen and then white birch, which are both shade intolerant. They come up after a major disturbance. So probably in the past, this was harvested pretty heavily and uh, gave us the composition we have today. And what they wanted to do, this, this stand is pretty much falling apart. There was a lot of um, dead standing stems and so forth. And so they really wanted to capture the mortality. They wanted to get those highest risk stems and harvest them before they uh, succumb to natural mortality. So they primarily targeted their larger uh, aspen stems and um, some declining spruce by the looks of it. And that's fine, that makes a lot of sense given the condition of the stand. So there's no inherent problem with that. No, the real problem comes from what they left, which is much the same. Um, the residual stand is full of fairly large white birch, frankly, at the end of its life. And the softwoods they left, they left a lot of cedar, um, a lot of spruce, and still a lot of fir, mostly the smaller fir. But they're just not in good conditions. The crowns are very thin, uh, the growth is slow. These are very stagnant individuals they left. So basically what they did is they came in and they took the worst of a pretty bad bunch. The remaining timber is not going to produce much value. The species mix is pretty good actually. There's a lot of valuable marketable species, especially the spruce fir and cedar, um, but they're just not growing very well. They're not vigorous individuals. They're not gonna put on much additional volume over the next even two decades. Uh, so they're not really serving the landowner or even the forest that much. But that's only like half the problem. You know, given the alternative, which is a clear cut or a heavy harvest that would have led a pretty ugly looking area roadside for the next decade or so, balancing all other interests, you know, it might be worth it to have some um, residual timber, even if it's a little stagnant and not really doing anything. But the other element to this is the damage that was done during harvest. Now I did another video almost a year ago now, well, the year went by fast, uh, and I, I talked a lot about trails and how detrimental those can be to your forest. And I estimated that uh, a poorly set up trail system with a lot of damage can negatively affect your forest by up to 40% or even more. And in the comments, there are a few people who were accusing me of exaggerating, but no, that's, it's way more common than you'd think. And this stand is no exception. This is the exact type of stand that certainly um, suffered a 40% loss. Now this harvest was done with a cable skitter, which is a smaller machine. So the width of each trail isn't too bad. We're probably looking at 16 feet or so, uh, but the frequency is pretty high. The spacing in between each trail is relatively narrow and there's a lot of damage on the side of every trail. We're talking uh, rub marks on the side of stems. We're talking about broken branches and broken tops. And it's, it's just very widespread. We're seeing it on, I'd estimate, at least 20% of stems. So basically what happened is they came in here and they saw all the mortality, all the dead standing trees. And they thought, we have to act. This is high priority. We have to act to uh, reduce the number of trees that die in the next 10 years or so. We want to harvest those trees and sell them before they're lost forever. And I've done a video about how important that is um, for optimizing your forests is preventing that mortality from, from happening. And so they came in here and they tried to capture that mortality. They took out the largest uh, aspen, they took out the overmature and declining spruce, and so forth. 
But then what ended up happening is they massively increased the chances of mortality for the residual stand inadvertently. And they did this through two ways. The first being the damage. All those scars and the broken tops and limbs, those are going to act as um, introduction ports of, of rot into the stem. And that rot can occur over a fairly short time frame. The second and most impactful way they increased mortality is by increasing the risk of blowdown. All of these residual stems, they're just not vigorous enough to fill in the spaces that were left in the crown. And so they're forever going to be more exposed to um, high catastrophic wind events, uh, high snow loads, and so forth. Usually, and it's, it's inherent that a stand is going to be more at risk of this, at least for the next few years after harvest. But if the stand is fundamentally unable to grow and to fill in those gaps or to increase their height to diameter ratio by putting on more diameter growth, that risk is just gonna stay there in perpetuity. And the difference between having high risk over a course of three years versus 10 years, that's a very big difference. Um, and so the chances that this stand will succumb to a high degree of mortality in the next 10 years is, it's almost guaranteed. So just on that basis alone, when it comes to silviculture and forestry actually benefiting a forest, mission failed. All they really ended up doing is just patting themselves on the back and making it look like they were doing the best thing. And that's to say nothing of the consequences to these guys right here, the regeneration. And that's kind of what floors me about this harvest is it would be one thing if uh, the ground was completely bare, there was no regeneration, but because we already had a decent amount of mortality in the stand, there were natural gaps forming, which has led to the formation of pockets of regeneration. And actually at this point, they're fairly well distributed and they haven't been alive for very long. So they're still very healthy. They're not stagnant. They have good terminal leaders, good foliage. This is exactly where regeneration should be when they're released, when they um, are exposed to full sunlight through a harvest. These things would just explode. They're very healthy, they're vigorous. This is your future right here. This is the future of the forest. We wanna promote these things. And had they done a heavier harvest, had they removed all merchantable timber, it, it would have been great. And because of all the aspen in the stand, those would have regenerated through the roots and the stumps, and you would have had a really nice mix of spruce, fir, and aspen in the next generation of the forest. And those are all pretty valuable species. So what I like to tell people in this situation is that this is exactly what would happen if Ben Bernanke were a forester. You have a toxic and too big to fail overstory that's starting to collapse. And so you put a lot of resources into trying to preserve it. And yeah, you succeed, but the consequence is a stagnant understory for the next decade or two and an unsustainable accumulation of public and private debts. And that's usually when the car goes silent and I realize I violated some sort of social more. So there's only one solution here. There's only one sensible action to take, and that would be to clear cut. Um, now let's talk about that word. What does that actually mean? Well, in the technical jargon sense, to clear cut something is to make a moonscape. Uh, there's no regeneration, no merchantable timber. It's, it's just dirt. Now, right now in this video, I'm not going to be using that definition. I'm just going to define it as removing all merchantable timber, which would include other treatments like shelter wood removal, when there is an actual understory to release, or even group selection or patch cuts, where the so-called clear cut is numbered in um, decimals of acres. Now, the reason why I'm expanding that definition a little bit is twofold. First, because the more I kind of distance myself from professional and academic forestry and work more directly with landowners, the more I realize that it is useful to work in dichotomies and then deal with the nuances later. And second, because the logic behind all those treatments that fall into that category, be it a very small group selection where you're just making a micro clearing or wanting to make a 100 acre moonscape, the logic should fundamentally be the same and the decision making process should be fairly similar. And that decision making process fundamentally comes down to one question. Do we want to manage the overstory or the understory? Is it possible to even pour more resources in the overstory, even if that resource is just time? If you don't want to or you can't, then it's time to start shifting our focus towards the understory, the future of the forest. And that might include the clear cut. And if that's the case, don't be afraid of it. Now there are two primary reasons why you'd be reluctant to use such a tool. And those reasons would be aesthetics and cash flow. If uh, you clear cut your stand, obviously it's going to be an aesthetic disaster. You're just going to have this ugly looking patch of land for the next, you know, at least 20 years. And likewise, if you only have hundred acres and you do a 100 acre clear cut, then you're not going to get a penny from that land except for maybe leases of some sort 
for the next 20 years. So it would make more sense in that case to try to avoid it at all costs. Let's say for sake of argument that you do have 100 acres and every acre on that property does eventually need to be clear cut. Well, you can stagger those harvests and how you stagger it kind of goes down to those nuances of treatments. That's when you can do something like a group selection or a strip cut or patch cut system. So let's say you can clear cut this property over the course of three harvests and 20 years. So you can clear cut 33 acres at a time and maybe they're in two acre patches evenly distributed throughout the stand. Maybe you can do it in strips. And the benefit of that is it greatly reduces the length of time that you're going without any consistent cash flow from that land. The other is that you're slowly regenerating the stand over, the, over time. So it's kind of like a, you could think of it as a consolidated shelter wood. So instead of having uh, micro gaps in the canopy over all the stand, you just have little, little patches of openings that can create beautiful little patches of regeneration. And so by the time that 20 year time period is up and you have no more merchantable timber, you still have a nice parcel of young timber like this. And that is very aesthetic itself. Sometimes I think we in the forestry community, we overvalue um, the beauty of large trees. Personally, I love to see young forests. They're great for wildlife. And I think they have a beauty that is unique um, especially in, in the fall or the winter. But what's crucial to understand here is that the benefit of doing it this way over a selection cut or a shelter wood or something like that is the stand that is not touched is left completely intact. So you don't have the problems with residual stand damage. You don't have the problems with increased blowdown risk and so forth that can make your situation a lot worse. The stand that you're harvesting is totally removed and the rest of the stand is untouched. Now, of course, the residual stand is in a pretty bad state, so it's not optimum. It's stagnant, it's not growing very well, but importantly, it's not at risk of catastrophe. Stands, the vast majority of the time, with the exception of insect outbreaks, um, they tend to decline over the course of decades, not years. And so you can leave that stand intact, even though there's a high rate of mortality and so forth. If those values are important to you, aesthetics and cash flow, you can leave that standing. It's, it's not going to hurt you all that much. However, if you do it like this and you do a 33% removal distributed across the entire stand, um, yeah, I'm not exaggerating when I say that we could see a 50% mortality rate over the next 10 years here because of this harvest. So these are the stands and situations where avoiding clear cutting or otherwise heavy harvesting can be pretty harmful to your forests and your bottom line. Um, and so we, we try to mitigate the disadvantages or the costs associated with clear cutting by mitigating scale. The question is, how much do you mitigate it by? How do you actually plan a system like this? And that's actually the next application I'm working on in Silvicultural. I'm developing a land and harvest planning tool that will allow you to calculate how much acreage you can actually harvest every year and remain sustainable and um, retain consistent cash flows. Uh, so I'm hoping to get that out by the end of November, but the software developers I work with are out of Ukraine, so sometimes there can be some uncertainty there. In the meantime, we still have our mapping application, our growth estimation tool, and our financial analysis tool available to premium members. And we still have a lifetime license available that provides access to all these tools and all future tools. So you can grandfather yourself and protect yourself from future price increases now before other tools are developed and published. So it's a really great opportunity. I'd highly recommend you go and do that. And of course, um, if you haven't already, you can grab my book, How to Read Your Forest for free with the links in the description and comments below. So anyway, guys, I'll leave you with that. Just as selection cuts aren't inherently good, clear cuts aren't inherently bad. So something to think about. Later.